A very good evening to all of you, and uh, we would like to welcome you to this session of the Sankal Global Summit in 2022. Uh, today, we are here to discuss on a very critical topic for Indian health, uh, innovating financing for primary health care in India. Okay, today, we have the honor of having some of the best minds in India to deliberate on this very important topic and the way forward for it. We will be discussing the various facets on how innovative financing has worked in India so far and the way forward as well. To speak on the topic today, we have a seasoned panel of experts from across the health domain and the moderator for this panel will be, will be Dr. Rajat Chabba, who is the Senior Technical Advisor for Global Solutions and Innovations at Japaigo from Baltimore in Maryland. The panelists for today are truly the who's who of the health world in India. Uh, headlining the panel is Dr. Indu Bhushan, who of course, as most of you will know, is the ex-CEO of the National Health Authority. Next, we have Mr. Abhishek Gopalka, who is the Partner and Managing Director for Healthcare at Boston Consulting Group in India. We have Dr. Ajay Nair, who is the CEO of the Swast Alliance, Mr. Ajay Sharma, who is the co-founder and the COO of the Desh Clinics, Mr. Madhav Joshi from the CEO, the CEO of India Health Fund, which is part of the Tata Trusts, Ms. Anjana Narayan, who has had global experiences across the health industry and now is the managing partner for 24-7 Strategies at LP. And finally, we have Krisha Mathur, who is the founder of Clinic Didi. I will hand over to Rajat now to start the discussion and I hope to have a very engaging conversation with all of you. Thanks. Over to you, Rajat. Thank you, Sagar. And greetings, everyone. And we welcome you to our discussion today at Sankal Global Summit 2022. In India, nearly 65% of healthcare is spending, spending is out of pocket by individuals. The remaining 35% is fragmented and comes from a number of central and state governments, funds, and insurance companies. The unprecedented healthcare crisis caused by the pandemic has brought a number of concerns about effectiveness and sustainability of healthcare system to the forefront. To add to it, the fiscal expenditure on public healthcare is only 1.4% of our GDP. But primary healthcare also encounters twin challenges. One, of a high price elasticity, which is a serious concern that consumers across income categories may undervalue or underconsume primary care and may value expenditures on medicines more than they value advice from the physician. The second key challenge is also around the high switching behavior. For a provider who intends to offer high quality primary care, this kind of switching behavior makes it difficult to provide for the provider to ensure continuity of care and can significantly impair the financial viability of the services that they provide. And in our context, the switching behavior is perhaps far more significant than the high price elasticity because it fragments the market and the already the small amount of patients that uh, small amount the patients are spending on primary care. While the COVID-19 pandemic was a wake-up call for most of our health systems and the topics of health financing gave great, great salience, India has been one of the front, front runners in testing out some of these new innovative models. We have tested out innovative financing approaches in maternal and child health, education, and tuberculosis, among others. While some of these models have shown promise, have proven to be uh, effective, there have been challenges that come across as well. One of the domains that innovative financing needs to be deliberated is its vast potential to create meaningful engagement models with the private sector health providers in our country, who are a major source of health seeking for Indians. The session today will discuss on some of these things that have worked around innovative financing and what are the next steps and the milestones in our roadmap to make effective use of upcoming tools and methods that exist. We will be listening to our thought leaders about how the multiple and ever-growing health challenges in India can be tackled by using an inclusive, consultative, and multi-stakeholder approach. With the last decade, it is also important to understand there have been some tectonic shifts. The growth of technology, digital tools has created unprecedented opportunities for us to move forward and create ways and partnerships that can change the future. Also, the, the increasing awareness level among the policy makers and the greater shift toward better public-private partnerships creates conducive policy environment and ecosystem for us to move forward. Today, I would request our esteemed colleagues to focus on two key questions as we move forward. One. Is it viable for us to actually eliminate out-of-pocket expenditure totally, or should we focus on reducing it? How can we strategize our resources well, given our current reality? And second, considering the 
critical role that private sector plays in complementing the public primary care services our innovative financing mechanism a potential solution to ensure equitable participation across public and private sector so without further ado i would like to welcome and introduce our panel to you. first on our panel i would like to invite dr indu bhushan who scarcely need an introduction dr bhushan was the ceo of aishman bharat uh yojana and the national health authority with the government of india until his appointment as ceo he served as a director general east asia department of the asian development bank he has held multiple positions with adp dr bhushan i would request you to kindly give your introductory remarks to us thank you well thank you very much rajat and thank you very much uh, for sankalp uh, 2022 for inviting me uh, to this uh, workshop uh, <clears throat> so you asked two questions and i am actually going to answering be answering four questions or presenting four questions for innovative financing uh, one why do we need innovative financing why are we here uh, second uh, what do we need to do in innovation to address the problems that i uh, address that, that need to be addressed third what are the different approaches which have been tried and fourth what are the challenges in innovative financing and uh, so just going back to the first question that why do we need innovative financing uh, basically uh, there is not enough money in the sector we know that india is one of the countries where we are spending least amount of money in health uh, we are i think one uh, 191 countries for which we have data we rank uh, i think uh, in uh, bottom 5 uh, percentile so of course we need to get more money and uh, government needs to put in more money uh, philanthropists and uh, other uh, uh, financiers uh, need to put more money and why are they not putting more money one is that they need some comfort that whatever money is being put we are getting something out of it so not only we need more money for health but we also need more health for money and uh, to give that comfort to uh, these financiers these uh, donors uh, we need to have systems in place that uh, can provide that and what happens in the sector is that till the time the check is written by a financier or donor uh, we are running after that financier let it be, be it any uh a donor grant donor or even uh world bank adb those uh, organizations which are providing loans uh till that uh, time that they approve the project they uh write the check we are running after them but once the project is approved they are running after the implementing agencies uh, that we uh, you uh, select the you uh, you implement the project in the spirit that we had agreed to and the problem with health sector is because the soft sector uh, there is that in the econ economics we have this uh, typical principal agent problem where principal and agent have that relationship but uh, agent uh, all the actions of agents are not uh, visible to principal so aligning the incentives and align aligning the incentive of agent with the principal is the key in terms of innovative financing so what what kind of innovation we need to have uh next slide uh so we need to have uh innovations which align the incentives of financiers and implementers so whatever financiers want and implementers uh, have agreed to do we should be able to assure that and the funding should be contingent on achievement of some agreed results at least to some extent that is the key and we also need to be uh, we need to understand that in health it's not only the delivery of services but the quality of services which is extremely difficult to quantify and to ensure that we have to have incentives that quality services are provided and quality services are provided to the people who that we intend to it's not to anyone but uh, maybe we have a target to uh, poor people uh, vulnerable people tribals uh, other other uh, group elderly uh, and women and so we need to ensure that uh those people are getting the money so how do we go about it uh, there are some of the uh, things that we have been trying uh, actually 
address those problems and i must say that ayushman bharat or schemes like ayushman bharat which support demand side uh, already have that innovative financing element in them because uh, if you just consider that for last 75 years most of our schemes were what we call supply side schemes so we build hospitals we will provide services and we assume that those services will be available to poor people right uh, and uh, so that's a uh, article of faith and uh, uh, all these big hospitals that we have created uh, we know that uh, uh, sometimes uh, poor people have problems in getting those services but in a demand side uh, so hospitals will get payment only if they have provided service to a to poor person who is identified as the beneficiary of ayushman bharat right so therefore this is already an innovative approach that if we can make uh, Uh, grants to each hospitals contingent on the fact that they are going to be providing services to poor for example aims uh, uh, currently gets uh, uh, more than 4000 crores and out of those 4000 crores we say okay you'll get 4 to 2000 crores as a grant money and uh, remaining 2000 will be contingent on if you provide uh, services to people in ayushman bharat and uh, of course that's very clearly identified so that is uh, Uh, already uh, innovative way of financing uh, health services which will ensure that uh, these hospitals prioritize uh, poor people right uh, other thing that have been tried is a loan buy down mechanism which uh, i had led in asian development bank where we were providing loans to many small countries largely in pacific island countries uh, who did not have um, good uh, uh, debt uh, repayment capacity but of course uh, they needed uh, resources they needed financing and so the loans were given at the same time in pacific island uh, is pacific area australia is a big donor and they wanted to provide uh, uh, donor money as well in grant money and they were struggling with the same principal agent problem that if they provide the money the money was not being used for the uh, for the purpose that they were providing money for so we had understanding with australia that okay we will provide loan to the country and if the country implements this project in the spirit that we have agreed so instead of country paying back the loan to adb australia will pay back the money to us if uh, the uh, this project is not uh, implemented well then of course country has to pay back money to us so in this case there is an incentive for country to implement the project well so that their loans uh, are written off uh, by australia Uh, australia was also uh, happy because they know that their money uh, is going to uh, support something which is and they'll uh, get those outputs or outcomes they are uh, uh, then they want to uh, have and we of course uh, we uh, get the most uh, development effectiveness because uh, we know that uh, money is uh, achieving those outputs and outcomes so it was a win 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 situation for uh, uh, lender like adb uh recipients like say tonga tuvalu and those poor countries and uh, grant financiers by so this can also happen in primary health care uh, other thing that we have uh, you mentioned in the background paper results based lending or what we call usually cash on delivery that you don't provide the money till they have uh, uh, achieved some uh, outputs or outcome so maybe you provide some seed money and subsequent money is provided only after achievements of certain results or uh, uh, we say uh, so some results in the matrix is uh, agreed and we uh, we call them disbursement link indicators dlis so once those indicators are met uh, the disbursement takes place uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, about technology uh, they could be e vouchers that uh, we could provide e vouchers to uh, beneficiaries and that money can be used only for that particular thing for example it's say say in primary health care uh, it's about the prenatal care and if you want to go and uh, use that e voucher for prenatal care or delivery in an institution uh, you can use those and that money will directly uh, e voucher can be could be given to provider and they can claim the money it could could not be used for anything else so it's very and direct delivery it could be used and of course you have uh, mentioned about the concept of uh, development impact bonds and uh, social impact bonds and uh, uh, one uh, such thing has been tried in ostrist in india 
I don't know what the results have been, uh, but uh, so there are some of the approaches that we tried. But again, the last slide, uh, you know, no, nothing is simple, and especially in the health sector, there are a lot of problems. And most of these approaches that we tried are outside the health se sector uh, because of many problems. One problem is that health outcomes are not only linked to how well you implement the scheme but also other social indicators. So uh, infant mortality rates or uh, um, uh, the many of the health indicators are contingent on uh, the nutrition levels, uh, status of women, uh, sanitation and many other things. So maybe you're doing a great job, but still you couldn't achieve those outputs and outcomes and that. So it will be unfair uh, to link those efforts to the uh, grants or uh, resources because uh, although you're doing maximum effort but still uh, not achieving outputs and outcomes. Second thing is that sometimes there is a gap between what efforts you put and the outputs and outcomes. You start uh, uh, building strong health sector, sector and systems uh, but it will take some time before you will see impact on uh, out outcomes. Maybe you can get some output. So for both first and second challenge, I think uh, one has to take a small a uh, slice of uh, health sector and something which can be directly linked to effort and it doesn't take time it can be uh, uh, assessed uh, identified or uh, measured in an objective way so that could be one thing and of course uh, there is a problem in measuring outputs and uh, outcomes on timely basis of course uh, uh, we have these surveys which are uh, spread out over five years then it uh, makes it difficult for uh, using some of the approaches that we have uh, but again, uh, something uh, could be done if we are taking a narrow slice. But the problem is that we, if we take a narrow slice and provide financing for such, such some very small part of uh, a health system, uh, then you are uh, you are contributing the already fragmented health sector where we have a lot of vertical programs and financing is there for uh, a small uh, uh, part of the health program rather than strengthening the whole sector. And that uh, problem will remain if you try to address uh, other problem. So with this, uh, maybe I'll just uh, hand it over back to you, Ajat, and uh, thanking you again for inviting me to this, uh, um, uh, this meeting. Well, thank you, Do Dr. Bhushan. I think you uh, I made note of a couple of points that you highlighted, which really stuck with me, I think around the need to align the incentives between the financiers and the implementers across the system. And at the same time, the tension that the system has in terms of the challenges that can be created through the interventions that we do. I think you spoke about how we run the risk of fragmenting the health system already an already fragmented system. So I think I'll, I'll request everybody to hold some of their thoughts and start put some of their questions in the chat as well. But I'd like to move on to Abhishek. Abhishek leads the BCG's, BCG's work in public health in India, and he has over 14 years of experience in strategy advisory, working with both government and private sector clients uh, at multiple levels, central, state, with multilateral agencies, foundations, and focusing on a host of topics, governance, digital service delivery, human capital development, public-private partnerships, and more recently, most recently on COVID-19 resilience response. So, Abhishek, maybe I'll hand it over to you to see that at a systems level, what have you seen and observed in the uh, in your experience that is critical for us from an innovative financing standpoint? Thank you so much, Rajat, and thank you so much, everyone, for uh, inviting me to this event. Um, I'll start by just echoing what uh, Dr. Bhushan said uh, and, and the two phrases that he used, right? More money for health and more health for the money. I think uh, the second one, that more health for the money, to me is actually pivotal because you will get more money for the health once the system, the finances have more confidence that you are getting more health for the existing money. So I actually wanted to build on that and talk about specific use cases in the context of primary care that we are beginning to see. And actually, the last couple of years have been very pivotal in terms of making many of these things a reality. You know, typically when we talk about healthcare, we talk about that iron triangle, uh, you know, access, quality, affordability. I genuinely feel that now we can start to think of them not as trade-offs, but as starting to think about them in parallel. 
So for example, it has to be access and quality at scale affordable and not that, you know, Hamara Desh will first work on access and then we'll think about quality, etc. So in that spirit, uh, the first category of use cases that I really wanted to highlight in the context of innovative financing and primary care is really around pay for performance. Now, this is not new as a concept at all, but we are now beginning to see application of it. And I do feel there's an imperative for both states and you know the development sector more broadly to really push much harder. So for example, uh, health and wellness centers, there is a component around performance-based incentives. In other words, there is an opportunity for the team, medical officers, CHO, AMs, to you know, really get compensated for the kinds of services that they're providing to the end beneficiary. So if you assume that you have a strong data system with verifiable data, how do we unlock performance-based incentives if the data is verifiable and reliable? Uh, you know, some states have started experimenting with it, but I think a lot, lot more can be done. And Dr. Bhushan's point, we should not be fragmenting it. The performance-based incentives has to be a function of a balanced scorecard of multiple different services. And only if you're delivering on those, do you get that extra incentive. This can also be a great way to attract doctors and other medical personnel back into the public delivery system, uh, which has, of course, been a long-standing challenge. I also feel that these services or these kind of thinking can be extended to frontline workers. For example, one of the use cases that was tried out during COVID was around e-rupee, which many of us would have heard of and come across, especially in the context of COVID vaccination. Uh, Dr. Bhushan talked about vouchers and how that can be used. The ABDM infrastructure, along with smart payments, makes e-rupee possible, which can be linked with basic services. Think about it. When you take an Ola or an Uber, you get an OTP and you use that OTP to verify that you have received those services. Can we use similar thinking to empower you know, rural women to say, Mere ko wo tika mila hai. I provide the ATP, OTP, and that's uh, you know, trying to solve the principal agent problem again, to say that yes, those services have indeed been delivered. And so you know, long-standing payments of ashas and things like that will no longer be an issue because there is almost a dynamic uh, you know, crediting of her account as she's delivering the services. So you're able to verify the, the delivery of services and you can make payments much faster. So again, just two examples of pay for performance. The infrastructure exists, a lot of scope and potential to push forward. That's the first category that I wanted to highlight. The second category that I wanted to highlight is how innovative financing can be used to leverage the power of startups, right? Again, this is not a conversation that could have been possible 10 years back. Uh, but just given the kind of involvement that they've had, again, not just as B2C, but even, even during COVID, I, I genuinely believe there is an opportunity to leapfrog. Uh, and we can really think about how do you mainstream the services of startups in the context of primary care. Um, I would again use two examples here, drugs and diagnostics. You know, many of these startups are really increasing their reach. Uh, they're not just metro tier one players, they're getting into tier three, tier four, rural, the coverage of zip codes. So can we have, you know, service level agreements, which we use to get into partnerships, genuine partnerships, we shouldn't be thinking about them as vendors, but genuine partnerships with the private sector to be able to, you know, deliver much higher quality of services in the primary care context, like drugs and diagnostics. And it's really interesting to see, you know, many states, municipal corporations starting to experiment with some of this. Uh, previously, it was being thought of just in the context of, let's say, 3PL, third party logistics. Now people are going a step forward and saying, you know, if we as out of pocket paying consumers can pay for our drug delivery to the doorstep, why shouldn't government partner with that? And, and does advancements in logistics bring down the unit cost enough to make it possible? So just as uh, that's a second category to say, you know, how can you use innovative financing mechanisms to be able to partner with startups and uh, innovators? The third one, of course, is the uh, holy grail, which is paying for outcomes. Um, I will first admit that there is the challenge of the verticalization and further verticalization that uh, the Dr. Bhushan talked about. So with that caveat, 
I will say that you know it's a it's a it's a powerful instrument. It will have to be used with a lot of care. Uh, my own view is you know areas like infectious diseases actually lend themselves very well. You know, as we think about you know our goal as a country to eliminate tuberculosis, if we think about the ninety five, ninety five, ninety five goals in HIV, these are very specific areas with very specific measurable outcomes. Whether it's viral load suppression in the HIV context or TB notification in the TB context, very specific outcomes around which you can wrap, um, you know, innovative financing. So think about again combining this with the second point around startups. You can actually have end-to-end -end ownership of notification for a particular patient, and you wrap an innovative financing mechanism around it. So again, I admit that there are those challenges of the verticalization, but in terms of being able to eradicate some of those diseases, I think there's a lot of potential out there. The last thing I just wanted to talk about was around enablers. I think the conversation on innovative financing would be incomplete without some of the building blocks. None of these use cases will be possible uh, in my mind without enablers. Three major ones I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is obvious, which is uh, the data systems. I think having beneficiary level verifiable data systems is an absolute no-brainer. Um, ABDM is a godsend. I think the whole nation owes a lot of gratitude to, to Dr. Bhushan for having got that journey started off. Um, but if that becomes possible, it just unlocks a whole number of, of applications and the use cases that we uh, kind of talked about. So that's number one. Number two is procurement reform. Uh, we've all been talking about it for a while, but again, if we do want to uh, get the startups involved, uh, bring in more private capital, etc., you know, timely payments uh, has to be a big uh, lever that we need to get serious about. Uh, so smart contracting, escrow accounts, etc., but really making sure that we take care of working capital issues and, and making sure that the private sector gets more confidence to get involved. Um, and then last is the organizational aspects. You know, for government to be able to truly take advantage of these innovative financing levers, there will have to be new capacities, new muscles that need to be developed within government. Again, two examples. One is, 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 a, is a fairly long-standing one around the PPP cells. You know, how do you truly uh, partner with, with, with startups? Again, uh, not vendors, but true partners in this entire journey. Uh, how do you uh, make sure that payments are on time, et cetera, the use case thinking, all of that. Um, the second is almost uh, chief technology officers. Many of the organizations that we work in on this call itself, you know, a CTO is a very common thing. Um, as we start thinking about the state health systems and the critical role that technology will play, you almost need or many organizations within the health departments, which are really thinking about the technology backbone infrastructure on top of which these use cases ride. So again, three major enablers, really strong data systems with verifiable beneficiary level data, without which you cannot build the use cases on top, uh, procurement reform, and a lot of organization and capacity building in order to unlock these use cases and see the true value. So I genuinely believe that, you know, innovative financing in primary care can be a massive unlock. Uh, and we just need to push forward on these use cases supported by these enablers. Thank you. Back to you, Rajat. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. I think your point, you made an extremely powerful point around the role that social enterprises and startups can play in this space. And I think the point around drugs and diagnostics is critical because often the insurance system is able to cover the hospital and the institutional care, but these are out-of-pocket expenditures which are often uh, left out of that system. So maybe, and it's also a good segue for us to actually get an understanding of what the private sector role can that the private sector can play for for from an, for innovative financing. I think we both you and Dr. Bhushan spoke about the need to have more health to create that confidence and demand. So maybe I'd like to uh, invite Anjana Narayan. Uh, she is currently the managing partner for 24 by 7 LLP and serves as a senior advisor at Private Equity Pro Partners. Uh, prior to that, Anjana has worked with GSK, Merck and Bayer and, and has created opportunities for equitable access to healthcare medicines and vaccines through her work. So maybe Anjana, I'll pass it on to you to actually share uh, your thoughts on how the private sector can actually be engaged in this process. Thank you, Rajat. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. It's really exciting to be part of this dialogue. And um, I have to say, I've spent my career in healthcare on the pharma vaccine and biotech side. Um, and uh, it, it has been very heartening to attend uh, the last two days of the Manthan conference and then to be here today um, and listening to this uh, distinguished panel. Um, we gather today with a common passion to see equitable access to quality primary health care. And the reason is, is that I think fundamentally everybody understands that by taking care of primary health care, you're creating a virtuous cycle where you have a healthier population that leads to a healthier nation. And I know that this is a very, uh, you know, motherhood and apple pie statement, but uh, actually from a common purpose standpoint and a vision standpoint, this is something that we see in the discussion today. I think I wanted to preface my remarks by also saying that while many attempts have been made around the globe with a variety of different uh, health system mechanisms and models, there's yet to be a perfect healthcare system. All the systems have some pros and cons. And I think we have to go forward with not looking for perfection, but looking for progress. And we have to be benchmarking that progress. And I think that what we have seen, um, and I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Bhushan uh, for the work that PMJ has done and uh, the progress that we've seen over the last five years, uh, and it's been really, really phenomenal. So as was mentioned earlier, India's healthcare uh, spending is about 3.6% of the GDP, which is far lower than uh, some of the BRIC countries. Uh, and about, uh, you know, getting to the 2.5% of GDP is going to take some doing. Um, but I think we have to also remember that getting to the 2.5%, we're going to ask ourselves the question, who is going to pay for it? And uh, how are we going to manage the expenditure which comes along with the increase in those payments? Um, uh, in listening to the implementers the last two days uh, that came from the states, for example, Uttarakhand, where in Terry, they have covered the entire population, uh, regardless of income levels, with the public funding, uh, the discussion really was, how do you sustain uh, that spending? Also Maharashtra, which has a hybrid system, had the same question, you know, insurance premiums are going up every single year. So how do you create a mechanism that is actually profitable, yet delivers on uh, the, the promise of primary, uh, primary care? So in order to achieve the SDG goals, uh, by the deadline set by the National Health Authority, it is imperative that we keep special populations in mind because you can't, I think you can't uh, provide the same focus to everybody in the country. This is a very large population and we have to be very focused. And uh, I think someone said this earlier, which is uh, mortality of children under five years of age, certainly in the SDG uh, goals, along with the health of older adults, uh, the maternal populations and uh, the morbidity and mortality in the maternal uh, areas and also taking care of the essential workers uh, is uh, extremely uh, important to uh, consider when you're considering funding. We discuss also the devastating impact of catastrophic illness on uh, the missing middle, along with the near uh, poor who are almost at the poverty line but not covered by some of the schemes and indeed preventing diseases and making sure that primary care is taken care of where the health and wellness centers are stocked, the telemedicine facilitation is happening, diagnostics, vaccines, and other measures are actually provided at these uh, healthcare centers is imperative to, uh, to creating trust in the population that they, they can actually access these services as was intended. I think one of the key learnings from, for me at least for the last two days was also to listen to speakers who said that even if you provided all the funding, would the people come to the healthcare centers? Would, would they be able to trust what they are going to be hearing at these healthcare centers? Are they going to trust that they're going to get the care that is actually required? So I think we have to address both the supply side, but also the demand side in creating trust by creating the funding for, for these centers. 
Um, as far as the innovation funding is concerned, I was working in vaccines for a very long time. And I can tell you that uh, the uh, uh, putting together of Gavi Alliance was the first global uh, outreach that I saw in terms of bringing key stakeholders together to be able to create funding avenues. Uh, the partnership model is a simple one. It's a public-private partnership. They capitalize on the sum of their partners' comparative advantages. The business model is by pooling demand of, for vaccines from the world's poorest countries, securing long-term funding, and shaping the vaccine market and also procuring that they need at the right pricing. And I think what they're leveraging is the economies of scale. They were able to actually bring the volume together. I don't think in India we have a volume issue. So I'm speaking for the industry to say that actually we can create mechanisms where you can lower the uh, contractual procurement uh, costs by creating that leverage on the economies of scale and taking into account what PAHO what Gavi and other uh, funders have been able to do, which is to really leverage the, the power of, of volume to be able to drive prices down. Um, and this is in conjunction, of course, with working with critical partners, with the industry uh, in a business model that actually, uh, you know, it, it rewards uh, working together. And this was seen actually in the uh, uh, COVAX AMC during covid uh, 19. We know that uh, countries with the lowest incomes would have been at the back of the line to try and get vaccine doses. Um, uh, of course, we're all very happy with what happened in India and how the implementation happened for uh, the vaccines. And I, I was just looking at the numbers today, about uh, 2.2 billion vaccines uh, have been administered already in India, which is a phenomenal number, and creating the electronic records. Uh, which unlike many of the even developed countries uh, did not happen. So very impressive. However, for the COVAX uh, funding mechanism, there was a political will. There was an industrial will uh, to be able to work together. There were funders, donors, and self-sustainers and self-funders that came forward. And of course, the main organizations that were working together worked together very well. So you had CEPI, you had the WHO, UNICEF, uh, and as well as Gavi coming together to create a mechanism that would be able to get the donors' monies in, to be able to actually get procurement of the vaccines. And remember, in 2020, we weren't sure that the vaccines were actually going to be effective or, or even be able to be uh, marketed at that point. But there was a risk-taking that happened with COVAX. They assured uh, through the uh, funding that they created to the manufacturers that actually there was a volume that was going to be purchased by COVAX. There was intense negotiations with uh, developed countries that were in a way hoarding uh, vaccines to be able to create donation mechanisms that would be able to get the vaccines to the LMICs. And also really from a practical standpoint, creating the readiness in countries to be able to get the COVID vaccine required a lot of muscle. Uh, they provided about 1.7 million doses into about 91 countries. They also provided 800 uh, ultra frozen uh, uh, freezers to 70 countries that had no way of uh, receiving the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So uh, there was a lot of implementation challenges at the local level that we saw being solved through COVAX. And I believe that, you know, when you take a look at private market funding, everybody is looking for uh, the health of the money, right? But actually, in the stage that India is in right now, uh, while we talk about profitability in primary care, the practicality is that uh, is going to be very, very hard to show profitability to funders. Uh, this is why, even though it's such a huge opportunity, you don't have much uh, funding coming through for primary care. However, there is an element of, of, uh, of putting social impact into the primary care area and inviting investors who are interested in a a uh, public-private partnership with reinforcement of volume discounts of other guarantees that can be provided uh, as far as reimbursement and also creating uh, smart contracting to be able to bring 
uh, the industry to the table. Uh, whether it is uh, obviously products made in India or they are products that are going to be uh, brought from uh, uh, global sources, I think the supply chain will be robust if we can create the mechanisms to be able to bring the products and services that are required uh, to the table and be able to provide the kind of care that is required in the primary care setting. Uh, I just wanted to also point out that um, you know, novel funding mechanisms are already in place that we see uh, in, in many of the uh, test cases that were uh, provided. So, for example, um, uh, Samridri uh, is, uh, is actually mobilized a capital pool of about USD 250 million as of January 2022 uh, in both grants and debt financing provisions to healthcare enterprises, US aid has been acting as a guarantor uh, in strengthening a bank's ability to actually lend uh, underserved uh, healthcare enterprises catering to customers, uh, including vulnerable populations, etc. And of course, you've got the Skill India Impact Bond, which again is basically uh, fashioning themselves as uh, the uh, if are raising capital on the capital markets. So there is an opportunity of actually working at the ground level, trying to find social impact uh, providers that would be interested in not just uh, profitability, but also a social impact. So I would say that uh, in terms of uh, building the financing, building the innovation, working with startups to actually get primary care rolling to where we want it to be, and also the public-private partnerships. Uh, it, uh, you know, there is progress in the, in the field and we need to continue to work on that. Thanks, uh, Anjana. I think you made a couple of great points in terms of, one, while it is hard to show profitability, I think there is opportunity for impact investors and different financing mechanisms to actually be looked into. And I think your point around pooling the demand and with the volume that we bring in India, I think is, is a great opportunity for us to explore and unlock uh, going forward. It also, uh, I think, provides a great segue for us to actually re invite Madhav, uh, who is the CEO of India Health Fund, a Tata Trust initiative which funds the development, de-risking and adoption of science and technology-led solutions which can improve outcomes in diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of communicable diseases to create impact at scale. So, Madhav, maybe it would be great to learn, I think, the challenges that we are facing and the opportunities that we see uh, with the scale that we have in terms of how the ecosystem can actually come together. And I think you've been trying to leverage, everybody spoke about digital as well. So how do you see that those digitally enabled platforms along with financing can actually help us move forward in you know, in this space. So, well, you thank you, Rajat. Appreciate that. So um, I'm really going to focus, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around the delivery side of innovative finance. I'm going to focus on the development of the tools that are needed to really deliver good quality primary health care. And that's been the experience at India Health Fund. Uh, so yes, we were set up to identify promising technology which could play a role in improving outcomes. But more importantly, we were set up to address an area of market failure, which was the non-availability of capital and financing to take promising technology from lab to market and the so address the so-called value of death, which is very different from what's been happening, non-communicable diseases. And our experience, I'd like our experience really sits in three areas. One particularly in the area of communicable diseases, which is what I think Abhishek alluded to, there is probably a greater need for innovation as well as capital than there is in many other areas. And I think we've all now lived through the COVID experience to really understand what the impact of a poorly functioning health system can be, particularly at primary care. But underlying that is a very, very clear focus on what technology needs to be solving for. So the good definition of the problem statement is critical. And with that, what we found is that it's very possible to identify the right technology interventions. But enabling them is where financing has a role to play. 
because a lot of developers do not have the capital, they don't have the market access, and they certainly don't have the data access that's needed to apply technology to address a problem. And that's typically where an India Health Fund-like organization is now coming in with the, not just the patient capital that many of these solutions need to enable their development, but also to facilitate the right access to particularly the public health system, which enables the developers to work with the service providers from the get-go to make sure that the solutions are designed for purpose. Um, these developers have access to the data that they need to really develop, particularly, and we spoke about digital, so maybe I'll focus on that, the, di the digital arm of the solution. And the last leg is really from development to deployment, particularly in healthcare, there's a big black hole, which is called evidence. And that's typically where a lot of solutions, again, lack the capital and financing to really enter the health system uh, to demonstrate outcomes that the solution was designed for, and then uh, create the use cases and the uh, business cases that are needed for the health system to adopt. And that's the entire journey that India Health Fund has been enabling. Uh, and I'll quickly run you through, I think, one of the more recent examples we've had. Uh, Tuberculosis has been identified as an issue of national importance, given that our elimination goal is 2025 and we're far from it, particularly with the disruptions that COVID has caused. Early notification of TB is critical. And the limited infrastructure, particularly in remote TB endemic areas, restricts that. Uh, tech, AI based technology has a role to play because it can supplement limited manpower and eliminate the need for a radiologist to read a chest X-ray. The technology exists. Enabling the technology by supporting the development of the right algorithm, but more importantly, demonstrating that the algorithm works is what we've done with, with the Central TV Division and state governments across uh, eight states now. What's that demonstrated is that Diagnosis time can be brought down to two minutes from seven days. Time to initiation treatment is down to a day from 14 days. And the patient follow-up is much more effective because all of, this, all of this diagnosis is now digitally enabled, so the notifications happen immediately. And it's all within the um, electronic databases that the NICSHA system provides. This wouldn't have been possible without patient capital. But what the patient capital has enabled is a virtuous cycle. Uh, by in opening up market access, the organizations that are developing these algorithms now have steady revenue streams from the scan, scanning services that they're providing, which is enabling both blended finance to come in to cover their capital costs, as well as invest, uh, investment capital, which is helping them scale much more rapidly and faster because, as was mentioned earlier, India has a large enough uh, market to really demonstrate potential for this. And the fungibility of technology has allowed a solution developed for tuberculosis to be developed into a long health suite, which is now covering not just uh, tuberculosis, but COVID, lung cancer, and a number of other lung conditions. So that's just made it a much more capital efficient, uh, commercially viable solution, relevant across both public and private sectors. So I think that's where patient capital can come in, but more as a catalyst rather than as a, mean, as a means of funding in itself. And I think that's the biggest role that innovate, that we've seen innovative financing mechanisms can play in seeding the development of technology to really take it to the last mile, particularly for underserved and vulnerable populations. I think great points, Madhav. I think a couple of points that you made, I think, around patient capital and also around, I think, the ability to create a platform which can then be actually, which is 
say technical area agnostic right it can actually be used for much larger purpose rather than being limited to particular disease area in creating those opportunities are i think extremely critical and it also provides me a great segue to actually move on to somebody who actually worked in patient capital as i am looking at you <laughs> with your prior experience of working at acumen fund and also with your experience of co-founding one of india's first telemedicine platforms i believe in mera doctor and currently your on ground experience with swast alliance and maybe you started as working in rural clinics in bombay and <laughs> rural maharashtra right so what well, it will be great to learn from your experience in terms of as an implementer do you find these models valuable do you what's the feasibility that you have seen in your experience over the years and okay. please now th- thank you thank you rajat and thank you for having me here um i think i'll basically the way i sort of look at this problem is that you know we're talking about two different things so we talk about financing which is how do you really make money available for care uh, but a lot of the conversation around outcomes etc is also really about contracting uh, and, uh, and and contracting is also where the you know in healthcare especially where the principal agent problem comes in uh, where the question of how do you really get the bang for your buck comes in um, and you know there are significant issues there around data and benchmarks right so in india for example we don't really know what outcomes we can expect for what prices and we just don't have those benchmarks yet so and one of the things that we can we uh, can hope for from abdm is that we can start collecting some of those benchmarks at a population scale uh, but i'll i'll you know i think i've been very fortunate to have really spent my life you know adult life in healthcare and uh, i will maybe talk a little bit about my experiences uh, and i've been fortunate to play various roles right so i started off as a, a medical student volunteering in bombay slums ran uh, primary care clinics in bombay uh, ran the clinic for government of maharashtra and palghar and uh, then went on to study public health and then uh, was an impact investor working in the us and uh, in nairobi uh, investing in primary care Uh, and then setting up a, a telemedicine service which really started off as a primary care service but I'll, I'll talk about some of the lessons from there right and and one sort of overarching comment from me is that uh, i would really think about primary care as a horizontal um, i'd really want to step away from looking at these verticals um, i'll and I, you know an example that really uh, stands out for me is when i was uh, doing my internship at gokuldas tejpal hospital in bombay uh, this was during uh one of the polio drives and i was posted in the gynecology ward in the labor room uh and i remember um having newborn babies and then going to the uh, to the staff nurse to try and figure out vaccinations and being told that all the vaccine fridges are stocked with polio because all the other vaccines have been thrown out because it's polio week and we have high numbers to meet um uh, so, so to me that's an example of how uh, you know we we can actually create a lot of destruction with uh, some of these vertical programs which worked really well right and separately also worked in the polio program and it was incredible to see how well it was run uh, compared to the rest of the public health system um but one of the things uh, that uh, to me as a primary care physician i you know ran clinics in bombay um was that the a majority of the primary care uh, in india is delivered by uh, private primary care physicians uh, be it uh, mbbs doctors be it ayush doctors be it uh, uh, rmps uh, or quacks as you may call them uh, but the fun- you know fundamentally the private primary care business model is fully broken right like so there's not enough money uh, in it for the clinician uh, and what the clinician uh, what many clinicians end up resorting to uh, is other ways of making money right this is, this might be uh, cuts and commissions this might be figuring out a way to uh, oversell drugs to patients uh, there's data around the significant majority of the antibiotic prescriptions in india being unnecessary and irrational for example uh so i think that's sort of one one point to consider um the other is that uh, you know we talk about uh the urban rural uh, issue in india where we actually don't have enough uh, practitioners in rural india and one of the things that we saw in africa especially in nairobi uh, when uh, you know i document one of the things that we did was that we invested in a chain of nurse run clinics and uh, kenya had a uh, you know progressive regulation around nurses being allowed to practice and uh, we essentially helped found a organization called cfw shops 
um, which is a chain of nurse run clinics, which now I think is in Kenya, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and a few other countries. Uh, and I think we really need to unlock uh, other healthcare workers in the Indian health system uh, to become frontline primary care workers, which currently we don't do. Right? Yeah. It might be uh, enabling nurses. It could also be uh, getting uh, um, RMPs to do more and somehow formalizing them, training them up, etc., because they're actually in the communities. Um, you know, I also set up a uh, telemedicine service, which was really started off as a primary care service. And and one big lesson uh, for us working in rural UP, rural Maharashtra, was that uh, trust in the system is crucial. So when we would go to uh, rural areas and try and pitch primary preventive uh, telemedicine triage and, and concierge services, yeah, one of the questions we would, or one of the remarks we would hear back often was that uh, people don't necessarily uh, care that much about preventive care or primary care, at least not enough to pay out of pocket uh, for it. Uh, but they were very worried about what happens uh, when a when a buddy bimari strikes or a, or a bigger ailment strikes. Right? So it's, and and these you know primary, secondary, tertiary these are all sort of artificial distinctions that we make in our own minds to actually understand the health system better. Uh, but from a patient's perspective, I think we should really look at the continuum of care and really building trust across the continuum of care, uh, be it in the public system or in the private system. Um, so those are some sort of, you know, big lessons for me that I bring to any of the work that I do now. Um, uh, I do think that the COVID experience is also interesting because, you know, if you think about, uh, this infectious disease pandemic, uh, a lot of what we saw in COVID, uh, was a result of our failure in building uh, good primary care, uh, at the grassroots, because that really is what, uh, we needed to actually, uh, manage the pandemic well and keep people out of the hospital. Uh, so to me, those are some key lessons that we should think about, but going back to financing and contracting, uh, I think what India should really enable is enable a lot of, and you know, India is a very large country. It's 1.3 billion people. There'll be a lot of variations. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I currently now live in Cochin and, you know, in, we, here we talk about palliative care and geriatric care because it's a very rapidly aging population. Uh, it might not be the same conversation in Bihar. It might not be the same conversation in Rajasthan. Uh, so I also think that there needs to be a diversity of models that are actually allowed to flourish in India. Uh, so one of the things that I would uh, really hope to see is a lot of full stack primary care services. Uh, it could be startups. I think like Abhishek mentioned earlier, there are a bunch of very interesting startups that are uh, trying to do ambitious things in primary care. Uh, it could be public uh, health organizations. It could be nonprofits. Uh, but we need to see a lot more happen, a lot of diverse models uh, being then compared apples to apples and outcomes and costs, uh, which we are not seeing today, right? So that's really what I would hope to see uh, from any innovative financing that comes through uh, in primary care. Uh, so I'll stop here, uh, and I hope I've like, overshot my time. Thanks, Ajay. I think great point around trust being so crucial in the system and looking at it as a horizontal. I think we always talk about how we can look at primary care as something which is comprehensive, continuous, uh, and coordinated in nature and not just driven by vertical parameters. So I think great opportunities. I think this also gives us a segue to Krisha to reach out to you because of your experience of say working in tele telehealth led technology led nursing clinics in Maharashtra and also your Dr. Bhushan and others were talking about result based financing, outcome based financing and your experience of working in dips. I think it will be great to learn from your experience in terms of as a founder of an enterprise called Clinic Didi and also as social finance manager at British Asian Trust, how do you see the opportunities of these models? Right? Are they actually working or are we actually spending too much time in actually designing them? And, uh, and it takes a long time for us to see a potential impact or evaluate them. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Rajat. Uh, firstly, thanks so much for having me on this uh, on this discussion today. It's lovely to, to be here at Sankalp again, and you know, surrounded by some absolutely brilliant speakers. So, thanks for that, Rajat, and the Sankalp team. Um, so, yes, I I come from a background of both having worked in primary care on the ground, setting up tech-enabled nurse-led clinics for many years um, at ITT, and then you know, Clinic Didi. Uh, but in the recent years, I've worked um, on the ground, working with both public and private sector partners uh, in setting up a pay for results partnership, a first of its kind pay for results partnership by the government of India's uh, 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 
unit national skill development corporation came together with private sector partners to say that we want to move the conversation from paying for outputs to paying for outcomes and how do we talk about the sticky problems in the livelihood sector um happy to talk about learnings from both of these experiences um today and how we can think about these learnings in the primary care context um i think taking a step back uh, blended finance or outcomes based financing these are often used interchangeably but at the heart uh blended finance is about bringing in philanthropic capital with private sector capital uh, or public capital to de-risk private capital um uh, outcomes financing is a subset of that where the donors or the government want to drive specific outcomes and want to use philanthropic capital um as a leverage for that um some great examples in in india already we've talked about some of these the samrith blended finance facility is is doing an excellent job i think they've already raised uh, enormous enormous amount of capital they've worked through the pandemic um you know de-risking and supporting innovations on the ground um there's also the utkrist impact bond which uh, was aimed at improving quality of care for maternal and child health uh, in primary care clinics in rajasthan um so if you look at all these examples uh, rajat i think the thing that stands out is what is blended finance currently being used for and how can it be used uh, you know to talk about to to solve for some of the challenges that dr bhushan laid out so beautifully um i think the biggest one that stands out to me is while blended finance can bring in additional capital it can you know act as a platform for innovation but i think the the biggest value add that it can add in in the context of primary healthcare is risk risk sharing and risk shifting uh the fact that philanthropic capital can come and de risk private money uh, public money um uh, and uh, give more bang for the buck which dr bhushan talked about i think that's one of the key things that uh, you know we can we can think about in the primary care setup especially as uh, i think the question now is around viable business model how do public sector and private sector come together what are vi- viable business models uh, where do we need to de risk um what are the models in terms of pricing in terms of procurement i think these are all you know great questions that can be answered through uh through blended finance one example that comes to mind is from the skill impact bond um, that we helped design while i was at the british asian trust um bat was the uh, you know organization that helped design and you know work with both public and private sector partners i think when you think about uh, you know the sector where private sector mostly provides innovation and government provides is is usually the payer um the risk still sits with the private sector uh and often you know uh, the the traditional sources of funding are not available to them and in a in the in the in a crisis like situation like a pandemic even the traditional funding uh, funding which is available at a higher cost may not be uh, available to these to these innovators i think that's also true for the healthcare sector where we have lots of startups as a very uh, active very vibrant startup ecosystem in india but uh funding for them is usually either very expensive or uh, not available in the context of primary care um i think one way to think about it is in the uh, in the impact bond ecosystem what in the skill impact bond what we thought about was can the government take the initial risk can the initial risk uh, nsdc came in uh, not as an outcome funder but as a risk investor because risk capital was simply not available uh, they provided uh, early debt uh, collat- uh, early uh, i would want to say working capital to these uh, to these skilling providers and help de risk uh, 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 the outcome payers in this case um, i think we're seeing a similar model in samrith where uscid is providing uh, is providing uh, uh, guaranteed capital is provide standing as a as a guarantor to to some of these startups and providing them flexible capital um, i think that's that's one of the main uh, learnings i see or one of the main roles i see for blended finance but i think a second part that i really want to talk about is um how do public sector and private sector come together because that's another key learning from the work that i've done on the ground um while we all keep talking about the uh you know the innovation that the private sector brings the fact that uh private sector is really driving service delivery working well on quality etc i think it's also good to stop and ask what does the public sector need uh you know to do these things at scale what kind of support do they need to you know improve systems to improve procurement um and that's another place where um uh, i guess tools like impact bonds or, or blended finance tools in general can come in and you know allow a platform or allow a closed um uh sandbox to trial a few of these measures to work within the system yeah. to try that so okay, i'll stop exactly. here i know i've probably exceeded my time but yeah. i'll stop here and back to you i think this is an important point and i'll come back to that because this is something that we want to discuss with the larger group as well 
around the issue around scale and the pilots that have been done in the past. But I think maybe I'll and Ajay, thank you so much for your patience till that point. But I would love to listen to your thoughts. You have been implementing Desh Kleenex uh, as a chief operating officer and in tier three, tier four cities and in rural India and including I IoT enabled devices being integrated into the system. I think many people on the panel till now raised the question around viable business model. I would love to hear your perspective in terms of how these business models can be made viable and that to at scale. And can innovative financing actually support such a such an effort? So over to you, Ajay. Yeah, thank you, Rajat. And you know, it has been a good learning session for me, apart from you know being as a presenter here. First of all, you know, it is very first question to be asked is why should somebody get into a rural level clinics as an entrepreneur when somebody has other means of earning good money, you know, as an entrepreneur. So the passion is the core. And when I started around a year back, July 21, I started because I myself went through a pandemic, uh, Corona. And I thought that, you know, if everybody, I, I'm from Delhi, you know, if in Delhi, I could not get a doctor. What could have been a situation in a village, you know, where there is no doctor available. Forget about, you know, the doctor term itself. So the passion is the main thing and the passion needs to be supported. You know, I liked the... Uh, statement by Anjana where she said that profit is difficult to come, but impact has to be you know, measured. We applied for a seed fund, health seed fund, and two rounds of you know, meetings. And I was dissuaded that why you have entered into this area where there is no profit, you know. So they asked us, you know, that what is the ROI, or, you know, how much money you have spent, etc., etc. I said, what do you mean by ROI? You know, it is first year. And as you know, Ajay and I said that you know we are struggling to change the concept from a jhola chap doctor to a qualified doctor through telemedicine, and the person has an issue that you know what will happen if next time I have the same problem, will the same doctor be available or not? So I'm struggling to capture some of the basic level concept selling on the telemedicine, and somebody is asking me, you know, you don't have ROI, you know, so this is not the good model. I also tried, you know, he was from Bangalore. I also tried and it failed. Now, it requires, you know, support, not only in terms of financing, but also moral support that, you know, go and, you know, work for the rural area because India needs it. So, so it's a passion, you know, which should drive and passion brings, you know, a lot of other things. Let me tell you that, you know, we thought that, you know, we will uh, present something and, uh, 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 you know, to the investor and we'll get some money. But we created our own internal model also that, you know, how we are going to get the money because I am a private entity and it's a for profit organization. So my business model should not be only dependent on the money coming from outside. It should be dependent on, you know, how we can generate money also. And we thought that there are certain things which we will do at our level, but not everything can be done. So there can be partners who are coming in. Again, you know, Ajay and I said that, you know, the people start thinking that, you know, how do we get money from cuts and commissions? But that's the, that's the reality, you know, that otherwise, if I'm providing the basic consultation in 25 rupees, I don't think I can feed my doctor or the, you know, infrastructure I'm creating. So here comes the, you know, the blended financing, which you are talking about that, you know, that how do we get the money? We approached Samrid also, but, you know, we were too young, you know, just seven, eight months old. So, you know, they asked us to wait for some time. We'll approach that. But here the, the importance is actually from the government side also. There are private players who are interested. I'll stop the uh, sharing now. Uh, there are private players who are interested in, you know, supporting the government also. I personally visited many primary health care centers before starting this. And I found that they are, you know, there are lack of resources. Either they are deployed or not available, but people are, you know, not having the adequate supply of the resources, which they should be. So the private sector can actually be involved in augmenting this stuff, which is already available. So you don't have to create an innovation every time you have certain things available. For example, I have access to technology. We are talking to some of the people who can provide us, you know, the good IoT based uh, solution. Uh, Schwast is one good one, you know, which is available. There is one guy from IIT Guwahati, you know, they have developed a very small 10,000 rupees, uh, you know, testing machine. But these are the things which we can actually deploy in PHCs also, the government PHCs also. 
So I don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I actually go and start working with the government and start delivering the results. So how sustainable? Maybe just because in the interest of time, uh, Ajay, how sustainable such a model is in your experience? Is it in our our model or the government blended model? In your model? In oh, your it model. is. It it is sustainable. It is sustainable to a level that it can run and it can meet <coughs> it meet its cost cost. You know, okay. break even is possible. So break even yeah. is not a difficult thing. People are ready to pay money. People pay us five hundred rupees for the super specialist, which otherwise they have to pay you know fifteen hundred. So and there is a is there a demand for services that already exist? Like, do you see a continuous demand? It, it requires education. It requires okay. education of the you know the local people. to understand that there is a difference between qualified doctor and there is a difference uh, the other quads okay. which are available okay there is a demand there is a demand thanks thanks ajay and thanks everyone for actually sharing your thoughts i think we brought out lot of critical points right from the result based financing the role of e vouchers looking at demand side schemes instead of supply side opportunities only and also the enablers that needs to be created i think the role for social enterprises is something that we spoke about and it's evident that there are so many models that exist out there already i think the key the first question that i would like to get your inputs is to understand how do you scale actually you know there's so many pilots models that have been tested that are available for us to look at what what is the right source for actually for us to scale these are diversified approaches and also what is the role that the public system can play in actually helping design these kind of in- innovative financing models and approaches i'll open it up to our panel to see any thoughts and reactions that anybody may have uh, on the group to begin with please Rajat, maybe I can start off uh, with your first question, which is how to scale. Um, one of the uh, points that has been coming up throughout uh, for all the speakers has been a lack of data. Um, you know, evidence generation is extremely important to understand where the problem actually lies in terms of where the uh, healthcare expenditure today is happening, and especially the lack of primary care. even though people think that a uh, lack of primary care doesn't really impact um, you know uh, your overall uh, health but actually by the time you catch the things you should be catching in primary care and they become really serious and you know you end up spending a lot more uh, with the catas- uh, catastrophic illness that you're going to face so in terms of scale i really think we need to be able to make good decisions and those good decisions will only be made if we can capture data one of the things that i've observed is that while we have data uh, we have fragmented data and we also are uh, not able to actually utilize the data to do the kind of studies that we need to do in order to uh, have the decisions uh, that you know that need to be informed so in terms of scale i really think that when investors come in they are looking for a baseline they are looking to see uh that there could be an alignment between the funder and the implementer so having very clear guidelines on what those uh, principles are going to be and then on top of that having uh you know a 5 or a 10 year plan which can only be done by an entrepreneur or by uh, an authority if you can have long term funding view um and so it's very important that when we are talking to funders bringing the uh, public private partners together that we have a long term view of sustainability uh, so whether that is procurement of uh, services and products whether it is uh, building procurement mechanisms for competitiveness over the long term and also doing smart contracting where you're not just contracting for one year but contracting for 5 or 10 years then you can see a long term for you know what volumes you need what kind of monies you need and what kind of implementation programs you are going to be tracking to be able to uh, uh, create that scalability and in uh, terms of role of public systems i really think that you know i was very struck by what ajay was saying which is you know really uh, people are going into some of these fields because of their passion 
uh, profitability may not be there, but they are there to make a difference where impact is really required. So I really feel like the first um, encouragement that has to come has to come from our own people. We have to be encouraging to the people who are doing this work. We have to uh, make sure that if we're having the conversations that they are about scalability, that they are about uh, their long-term plans and what challenges they are going to face. And I think from a public uh, system standpoint, just creating more transparency in procurement, more transparency in, um, in sort of the receivables uh, and uh, reimbursement will go a long way for entrepreneurs. Right now, uh, I can tell you when I talk to entrepreneurs, the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have is that if they get into healthcare, you know, are they going to receive uh, a grievance addressal process? Are they going to be able to get the reimbursement if they if they go into the government uh, reimbursement space? And is it going to be done in a timely manner? I think the IT systems which are getting in place now to be able to uh, guide that reimbursement, to create more transparency, we're seeing that in a lot of states coming through will go a long way. Yeah, so thanks. that's my personal perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Anjana. I think a couple of important points. It also begs the question, how do you actually create demand? You know, how do you ensure a continuous demand considering there is so much of shifting consumer behavior as well, which is prevalent in, in this case. And maybe uh, Dr. Bhushan, uh, if you can, how does that link from the perspective of Ayushman Bharat? I think they, it's such a wide reach that has been created. It will be great to hear your thoughts in terms of what's next for Ayushman Bharat. How can Ayushman Bharat play a role in enabling that demand for services? going forward? Well, you know, Ayushman Bharat, uh, I, I was there for about three years and uh, first uh, year was uh, uh, in planning the scheme and getting it off the ground, uh, two years of implementation. And within that short period of two years, uh, what I'd seen was that already uh, the demand, uh, of course, it's a demand side scheme where addressing those people who have never used uh, uh, private sector services, at least at uh, the private sector, I mean, formal private sector, of course, uh, as someone mentioned earlier that they do uh, use private sector services, uh, uh, which are informal, uh, as I think someone was calling Jhola Chaps. Uh, but uh, for getting to the private sector, this was the first time uh, many of these uh, families are using uh, private sector services. I give you one example. Uh, we were actually putting a lot of pressure on good hospitals in, uh, uh, in Delhi uh, for uh, uh, ramping up their work for Ayushman Bharat. So one of them uh, is government hospital. I'll now not uh, uh, tell you the name, but it's a very uh, reputed hospital in Delhi. And the director of that hospital once, uh, when I was reviewing the scheme, uh, told me that, you know, what happens that many patients come here and they get the diagnosis here. And uh, for example, if they need uh, bypass surgery or many other, any other surgical or big intervention, uh, they, and when they fi find out that they are uh, uh, eligible under Ayushman Bharat, they just go to a private hospital and get it done. Uh, so, I was telling you that, see, this is a reflection on the quality and responsiveness of service that you provide, because if they're going to a private uh, hospital, they're basically voting with their feet and uh, they're going there. So they're uh, using those uh, uh, private sector services. So, so there was a creation of demand for private sector services through Ayushman Bharat, because uh, these are 50 crore people who don't have the paying capacity. Now, Ayushman Bharat has given them uh, paying capacity and they can go anywhere uh, that they choose, either public or private. And this public or private mix varies from state to state. In some states, actually, they still prefer to go to, go to uh, public sector, for example, in Tamil Nadu. So there is a, uh, that demand creation. But one of the key issue, uh, I think someone, someone mentioned, uh, I think it was uh, Anjana, which uh, was mentioning is the comfort that we have to give to private hospitals that they'll be paid on time. And here, I think uh, some innovations are in order. One, that uh, 
government should try out models where they'll pay uh, without asking too many questions and after payment if they find that the payment was wrong then penalize those hospitals in a big way so that uh, onus is on the hospitals to ensure that they are uh, they are uh, putting right claims and uh, not resorting to any fraud and abuse second thing that i was thinking and actually we had tried this on uh, we discussed this uh, with large number of bankers was that if banks can provide loan to hospitals based on receivables uh, from ayushman bharat for example uh, there is a hospital uh, which has uh, three or four lakhs of receivables from ayushman bharat backed on that uh, uh, if uh, loan could be provided by the hospital by because uh, and they can uh, mortgage that uh, receivable in some way and uh, uh, so at least the hospitals will be will have that kind of uh, running capital and this interest payment if governments are delaying payment i think so it's a moral authority moral responsibility of the of government uh, to uh, compensate hospitals for that loss of interest and actually in uh, our documents it's very clearly mentioned that if the uh, any payments delayed beyond beyond a month we'll be paying uh, interest to hospitals so of course if uh, we are delaying payment uh, not because of uh, any fault of hospital i think this uh, interest could be paid by uh, by the government even if the interest is not paid i think hospitals will would welcome uh, this additional cash and liquidity uh, if, uh, if because interest rate for say example 6 months won't be that much and uh, so it will also help so i think uh, one has to now keep uh, uh, focus on how to give comfort to private hospitals that by joining ayushman bharat they will not go under they'll be uh, compensated for their uh, expenses and uh, they can still uh, make uh, like a continue to thrive uh, that is uh, something i think we we'll have to focus on so obviously there will be huge uh, increase in demand because this is an untapped area because large number of these people could never afford to go to private sector now they can thanks dr bhushan i think the more i hear from all of you the key that i'm hearing is that we need to have result uh, based payment systems not only for the services that we are delivering but also for the for the government or the systems which are actually enabling these kind of contracting ajay as you were say, saying as well so i think maybe ajay i'll come to you and then uh, to have your thoughts around scale ups you know you have been part of so many of su- many of such models as well and have seen them grow how do you scale is it you spoke about diversified is it the, and i'm taking a risk of going opposite to what you said you spoke about horizontal but i'm asking if there is a need to actually focus on few specific areas within primary care for actually for us to scale it uh, ac- uh, across a wider area Yeah, does it, I, I'm assuming the question is to me and not to Mr. Yeah, Sharma. Yeah, no, to you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. Uh, no, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a, so to me, there are a few pieces of primary care uh, that, uh, you know, so that do, you know, from a vertical standpoint need to be solved for, right? So one of it, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is just contracting and everything associated with contracting. um aishwan bharat has done a great pmj has done a great job around contracting you know package rates for inpatient care um uh, we have we don't have a similar framework around contracting for primary care uh and especially no you know we don't see anything around sort of population based contracting right so one of the things that we are seeing in global best models uh is that you really have to start looking at population health management for an empanel population Uh, for a primary care center as opposed to just looking at the individuals and we are not really seeing frameworks of that and it's we are not seeing that partly because of what i mentioned earlier right so we don't there's no good data there's no good benchmarks around that so even if you start contracting uh, you don't really know where to start there uh, so to me and and there are there are examples of of lots of pilots across the country you know currently and and also regulatory sandboxes right so for the example the ird as a regulatory sandbox uh which looks at uh, innovative models that are insurance plus and i know that the regulator has an interest in solving for outpatient care and uh, out of pocket payments uh so i think one 
one piece to solve as a vertical might just be contracting. Uh, the other piece uh, that sort of is critical to me is healthcare workforce, right? So uh, how do you really look at all of the available workforce that we have in the country? You look at uh, individual primary care doctors, public primary care providers, uh, nurses, uh, and frankly, the RMPs of the Jola Chaps, right? Like, and how do you really look at everybody who's there? Uh, and how do you really figure out what kind of skill augmentation do you need to do? How do you really need, how do you position this workforce to deliver the kind of care that we need to get? Uh, the last piece is around care pathways and, and clinical models, right? And we are also not seeing enough of that, uh, enough innovation there, enough guideline setting there happening. Uh, so what is really good primary care? Uh, what is good tech-enabled primary care? And these are all problems that we all grapple with in, in multiple forums. Uh, but I think those three to me would be sort of verticals to solve that enable this horizontal to come across, right? Like, so that's really uh, some quick thoughts from me here. Thank you. Richard, I just want to add one point on what Vijay talked about. Uh, you know, if you think about the protocolization of care uh, and something that organizations like NICE have done in the UK, I really feel like that's what India needs. You know, it, it, we, we cannot let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, there needs to be evidence-based uh, protocolization and therefore you need institution building like NICE and have a NICE equivalent in India. And that's the kind of reform and institutions we need for primary care. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. And it, it needs to it needs to be institutionalized very, very formally, right? And and, and you know, nice is for a much smaller population, so we need to do this uh, at a greater scale, obviously. So, Richard, I had one point. You know, primary care. You know, my experience is OPD insurance is one of the important thing we need to bring in. Uh, we found that you know, the, if we have a good OPD insurance, the load to the the hospitals is going to be lesser. If we get into the primary care or the preventive care, we are we have actually started, and I think in a month or two I'll have a you know I'm working with an insurance company, and we'll have the OPD insurance also built in. If we are able to bring that, I think more people will come. I'm uh, responding to your demand side, mm -hmm. and there's an adequate demand which is available, but it is that people do not want to pay for prescription. You know, people want to pay only for the medicine. So if we have the OPD insurance available, it will actually create a good demand and lesser load to the hospitals later. Thank you. And considering that we are close to our time, I would like to maybe any closing thoughts from any one of you to share that what would our audience would you like our audience to go home today with? If how is the impression around the opportunity for innovative financing? Should we be hopeful in terms of what where we are, or what do we need to do more? Definitely hopeful, I would say, Rajat. Given what we've heard from everyone today, I think one thing to take away is what Abhishek said stuck with me. Uh, you know, it's a it's a tool uh, at the end of the day. Financing will always be a tool to the outcome we want to create. Right? We cannot be a hammer looking for a nail, but if we design carefully, if we design for if we design with clear standards, if we work very closely with principles of scale early on, I think definitely I'm optimistic. Yeah, and if I can quickly come in, Rajat, we, uh, you know, we, we should also remember that we are in, in the middle of this epidemiological shift mm -hmm. um, where a majority of morbidity and mortality in India is more and more going to come from non-communicable diseases. Uh, you know, our health issues are not going to be solved by more bypass surgeries and dialysis machines. Uh, it's only going to be solved by primary and preventive care. Um, if we are not able to solve this, uh, the, the healthcare inflation and the cost of delivering healthcare to a, to a population that will rapidly start aging uh, will bankrupt this country, right? So this is a problem that needs to be solved uh, very, very quickly. Thanks, Ajay. It's only one thing to add, Richard, which is around ABDM. You know, when we think about the timing, uh, you know, the kind of population management approaches that Ajay is referring to in the context of NCDs, etc., is just not possible till you have some kind of registries, if you will. So I think ABDM allows all of those use cases to be built upon, uh, which was just not possible, you know, five, six years back. Um, I also feel actually that it will help the adoption of AD ABDM as well. 
which is at some level also an objective unto itself, but it just lacks those strong use cases. So it, it really goes hand in hand. I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you. I think it was great to hear your thoughts and the op opportunities that you share and the ideas with which we can actually build. I think the role around areas, I think Ajay, you brought out some great points around vertical programming in terms of contracting health workforce, thin tech we need to focus on and bring in efficiencies around. And Dr. Bhushan and others shared about the role for demand side financing and how we can actually generate more demand. The point, uh, there are also opportunities and areas we're seeing around the role for social enterprises, which are coming in this space. And that creates more and more partnership opportunities going forward. And technology, I think with ABDM and the things that we shared, we all agree is, is the next best thing that could have happened to us, right, going forward. So I'll take the opportunity to thank all of you and uh, for, for taking time out and sharing your thoughts and experience with us. Thank you. Thank you.